Hi everyone who's joining us. We're going to get started promptly at the top of the hour here, but we're really glad to have all of you with us. Uh, we're going to let some more attendees in and get started, as I said, right at the top of the hour. It's great to be, see such a good crowd. We've already got almost 30 people in the first 30 seconds. It's going to be an awesome presentation. Okay, I'm going to kick things off today with a little bit of housekeeping and then introduce our topic and our speakers. Um, so thank you all for joining us again. We're really glad to have you here. Um, you're welcome to use the chat function to chat amongst each other um, or introduce yourselves at any time. And we really strongly encourage you to use the Q&A tab in the Zoom toolbar to ask any questions that you have as we go. We are recording this presentation and the recording will be made available after the event and posted to the Drupal Association YouTube channel. Um, and with that, I think we're just about ready to go. So um, today we're talking about an awesome case study for decoupled Drupal. This is the story of uh, Penn State News, a longtime advocates for open source and users of open source software, including uh, Drupal, uh, or originally in Drupal 7, and now with a, a sort of new model of a content hub and brand management tool that forms the basis um, of their decoupled Drupal installation. It's a really exciting story, and I think you'll find a lot of compelling use cases regardless of your industry. Um, let's introduce our speakers today. Um, so many of you uh, may know me. I'm Tim Lennon. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of the Drupal Association, Hestinet on Drupal.org. The Drupal Association is the 501c3 nonprofit that supports the Drupal project. So if you participate as a Drupal member, thank you. Uh, if your organization is a supporting partner, thank you. Uh, we do our best to foster the community and bring great stories like these to you. Um, I'll go ahead and hand it to Jim to introduce himself next. Hi, I'm Jim Norris. I sit in the Office of Strategic Communications at Penn State. Um, my, my goal here is we're trying to bring a platform to Penn State that enables brand unity and establishes some development and hosting and DevOps and optimization standards and guided by uh, digital and content strategies. Fantastic. And Mark, please introduce yourself as well. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Mark Shropshire, and I am a senior director of development at Media Current. And I'm excited today to be sharing uh, a good bit about the architecture and technical implementation of this great open source platform at Penn State, which now supports 250 content editors and many content consumers. Awesome. So let's get started. So today uh, we're going to dig in to uh, the opportunities facing Penn State News. Uh, what brought us to this project originally? Uh, Jim's going to kick that off and then we're going to talk about what needed to be done. What were those requirements and what were the problems we were trying to solve through the project process? And then we'll get a bit more technical because um, I know we've got some technical folks uh, on this webinar that'd like to hear about it on the Penn State platform. Um, but don't worry, we'll talk about functionality at a high level also. And then have uh, plenty of time reserved for Q&A. So just a bit about Media Current. Um, Media Current, we bring together really just a great group of talented team members to provide world-class solutions for the web. And we are really proud to focus on open source solutions at Media Current like Drupal. Um, I'm excited to be here today sharing all these details about this uh, Penn State uh, web platform that we helped bring to life. And I wanna thank you, Mark, and the Media Current team for being supporting partners of the Drupal Association and part of the ecosystem that builds Drupal as a platform and awesome sites like these. Thank you, Tim. Okay, so today's topic is about Penn State News, uh, which is one large decoupled impl implementation and migration. But I wanted to set the stage a little bit with sort of just a higher level view of what we're trying to accomplish and how this project fits into sort of a, a larger and longer term strategy. So open source has been embraced here at Penn State for really over a decade. There's a wide adoption of Drupal here and it's, um, but there are a few 
standards and there's no central service, right? So every unit is for themselves. And frankly, if you polled our developers, they would say that's that's fine by us. So we have a decentralized landscape of development, maintenance, optimization, and we want to we want to leverage those strengths. So, but that's resulted in a like, really balkanized ecosystem and sites that look very different and sites that are developed, maintained and hosted in different ways uh, by both internal resources and often many different uh, vendors as well. So most refactors are rebuilds occur in isolation and they often, they often start from scratch. So at the highest level, this Penn State experiences this as expensive, there's low governance. It's harder than it should be to uh, align these things and to up, roll them up to larger university goals and strategies. And um, so the present opportunity is to leverage this commitment we have to Drupal as a platform and develop a series of digital playbooks, not rule books, but in service of executing on brand public facing websites. So what we're really trying to accomplish here is we're trying to introduce a design system for Penn State with atomic components and patterns and some federated components that listen on web sockets as well. Uh, content strategies that are tightly aligned to organisms and uh, template groups and components, an API first architecture, and really Penn State content as a service for multiple channels, right? Host, and then we need to host this in the cloud, assume constant optimization cycles, DevOps standards, predictable costs, et cetera, et cetera. So now to the current project. My office owned a legacy D7, highly customized and highly integrated Drupal 7 at a very large scale, 100,000 plus pages, quarter of a million various assets, et cetera, all told. Um, and we took advantage of the Drupal 7 end of life to reassess everything and initiated an in-house total rediscovery of our functional, our technical, and our strategic requirements. Awesome. I think one of the things that's interesting about your, your case here, Jim, is it feels like something that's going to be common to a lot of other folks in higher ed, probably a lot of our attendees here, this sort of decentralization and different departmental implementations and all of these sorts of things. Um, I mean, when you looked at this project holistically, what was it that kind of gave you the most heartburn about what you were about to undergo? Yeah, well, one of the things was jumping into a giant refactor on a forced march influenced by you know, the end, uh, 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 end of life. So the heartburn was that we were gonna use our current state as a functional spec and just try to rebuild it in D9 mm -hmm. and avoiding, avoiding the investment in discovery. Um, so we made sure we didn't do that and we thought this through. Right, taking the time to actually make sure it was a yeah. business driven um, uh, redesign and not just a, a technical motivation. Awesome, Absolutely. very cool. Uh, so our business situation, right? So the, the news website that we're talking about, it's our, it's our business system of record for news and our public relations editorial operation. So that's the CMS piece. And it's the publication of record for all of our public relations stories and our news stories. Um, and it, but it involves more than just my office. It involves the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So it's a very, we have a very decentralized marketing and communications business business function here. We have hundreds of authors. We say 250 or so, the number churns. We have 24 plus campuses, 70 plus colleges, divisions, and units that are all accessing this platform, getting their content in, turning it through the workflow, and extracting it back out into various channels. And it also, there's a piece of this, that is a, there's an email blast campaign, including Penn State Today, which is daily you know, flagship publication, digital publication. The D7 was a monolith. Uh, had AP, an API that, that executed content sync with 20 plus other D8 monoliths. It was on on-premises hosting. It had you know, a, lot of, a lot of labor invested into, into the hosting solution here on-premises. Uh, the site had thousands of taxonomy terms and corresponding RSS feeds that were really integration endpoints for our partners. And in some, it was a very effective business tool, but it was complicated and becoming fragile and quite brittle. Um, and all the parts, many of the parts were end of life, like really down to the metal. And when you say brittle, what do you, what do you sort of mean about that implementation? In what way was it brittle? 
Well, part of it is that uh, if I can be, if I can express a little self-awareness here, I think part of it is that we weren't necessarily the most strategic of, of builders and possibly clients to, 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 to other vendors, meaning that we, this, the old site built in increments, not according to sort of a rational plan, digital and web strategy. It was, you had functional owners that made requests and those requests were, were, were bolted into the system. And so it, it, le it led to a lot of collisions. It led to a lot of outdated modules, a lot of technical debt, and ultimately the multi-siteness of the platform. There were pieces of the website that simply uh, were very difficult to execute changes on because of all of the regression testing, the regressions that were induced by, you know, so a lot of words, but that's what Brittle meant to me. Cool, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, a little bit of color around the scale and scope of this. Again, this is a very, very, very big website, right? There's 250 authors, authors 24 campuses. Um, and each partnering communications office that is that's contributing to the content and extracting it back out, they have their own workflows and we support multiple content types. And the legacy system had thousands of taxonomies. Um, we integrated up and down with uh, downstream with a lot of unnecessary uh, integrations like with Flickr, with, with academic tenure tracking software, and PSU.edu, our flat, the, the home, PSU's homepage, which had about like 75 pages versus the 100,000 the news had, they were tethered as a multi-site. I like to say it was, it was like a tow on a jet ski from the back of a battleship. So part of what we need to do is, 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 is segregate these services and handle them more sanely according to their own strategies. And it's all bound by a single Git flow. And I should make it clear here that I'm, you know, I'm a web developer by trade, but I sit in the comms unit, so I'm not in IT. So our, our, our perspective is on how to influence other people more like me rather than run this as a centralized service. Um, so our downstream partnering websites and our systems integrate so that they can reuse the content. We use JSON, for asset syncing and RSS, like per taxonomy for, for our partnering websites. And we use an old school listserv to integrate uh, for the integration for our 50 plus like distinct newsletters and publications that generate our, multi, you know, our, 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 our email blasts, right? So our pit, we had this epiphany during discovery that we really are operating as a content hub, but we had no formal strategy around this. So we needed to start building towards this overarching strategy of Penn State reusable, like of developing a Penn State reusable content hub as a service. That meant a, a universal API standard as a foundation for the platform going forward. So we can deliver content agnostic, uh, a, a content, you know, deliver content that's agnostic to the receiving platform, right? There's a lot of Drupal here, there's Plone, there's WordPress, there's Expression Engine, there's things you've never heard of that are actually consuming our endpoint. And we needed to deliver a little bit of information architecture in the API too. Um, so those are our needs. In conclusion, um, we after our discovery, we determined that we needed to streamline our product, jettison unneeded bolt-ons, and go to market with a clean product vision. We needed to host everything in the cloud to reduce system administration and overhead costs. We needed to empower Penn State developers to own the front end and to set, that's more critical to our business. So we want to separate front end from the back end Git flow. Um, we want to establish a Penn State standard for front end coding. We want to onboard an atomic component design system, establish standards for the Penn State brand on the web, and establish this design system in a pattern library and enable new digital and SEO strategies. We're pruning content, we're re-slugging everything. We're moving from a, a strategy of single domains to, a, for, excuse me, from subdomains to a single domain off of psu.edu and re, remove a lot of bloat. We needed instant alerting as a service we needed a content API as a service. We needed pixel perfect preview. Our authors would expect nothing less. Uh, an improved authoring experience. 
And we needed to migrate and refactor this without disruption. If you're from Boston, you'll know about the Big Dig. This was a little bit of a Big Dig-like project. And uh, we thought that maybe we had a pretty good case for decoupled. <sighs> Fantastic. Is that all, Jim? Is that all you needed? <laughs> that sounds like a walk in the park. <laughs> Hi, Shrop. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you know, after Jim stepped back to get this holistic understanding, you know, they went through their, you know, RFP process and everything and found a partnership with Media Current. So, Mark, why don't you talk us through, like, how you took what needed to be done and, and, and made it happen? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, so, we had to really start with the discovery process and lead into, you know, defining those site requirements. And some of those included um, outsourcing of the hosting. It's something that was important for um, uh, Jim and the team for cost predictability on the platform, uh, less focus on the infrastructure internally and, and more on the business processes. Uh, and of course, a great content uh, author experience via Drupal uh, is definitely key to the success of this project. We knew that all along, um, and we still know that. We're still improving and working on that. But that includes content moderation workflows um, through just being able to easily enter content. And from near the beginning, I think we all felt like fully decoupled was the right choice. And we confirmed that through discovery processes and strategy. Um, but that front end became just a requirement based on needs around security, performance, recruiting development teams that Penn State wants to build, and even more. Uh, Drupal is a content hub here, and it allows Gatsby and Penn State campuses and, and more to access those data via APIs. While development workflows are improved here <laughs> by separate front end and back end Git repos, that really allows the teams to focus and work independently, uh, you know, on the front end or back end, um, and different needs can be met at different times, and we can release simultaneous or separately along the way. When it comes to building uh, for scale and reusability, uh, really component-based design is key to this project. Uh, we'll talk more about that today but we have a living style guide included in the project and that's really important and that allows designers to be empowered to build new layouts from existing components and not everything has to be brand new but you can start fresh uh, or use existing to build something that looks new which is really neat uh, content authors also have the power of drupal paragraphs uh, paragraphs is a contributed module and set of modules uh, to create content with predefined components that map back to the Gatsby front end uh, and allow us to do layouts that way. And I think that last component is just a really cool use case. It's really powerful to give editorial control within Drupal that um, continues to provide visual control all the way through to a decoupled front end. That's really neat. M most definitely, Tim. So we'll jump in a little bit here um, to why Drupal for Penn State overall. And, and I'll start out here with why Drupal in general, um, just for anyone who uh, maybe is not familiar or if this may, you know, this may reinforce uh, pre existing notions, but uh, Drupal has a massive open source community uh, providing not just the code, uh, which it's known for, but also support training and documentation. Uh, Drupal has a commitment to web accessibility uh, that's been there for, for a number of years. Uh, I love the fact, because I have a security focus, that Drupal has a formal yeah. security team and mature security processes. Uh, I heard Jim say, yeah, that's, that's always important to universities, without a doubt. No, it's fine, Jim. Like, I love that. And um, it's also fully customizable um, uh, through not just code, but all of the thousands and thousands of contributed modules and other bits of source code that uh, the community provides. Um, it, you know, I just love the fact that as a developer, I, myself, my team, Anybody involved in this project or working with Drupal projects do not have to write every line of code to build something. That is just a value that I really appreciate. And Penn State University has been using Drupal and contributing to Drupal, uh, the Drupal open source community for many years, which I think is great. So, uh, but I'm, I'm, that's kind of that general view, but I, I do want to uh, hand it over to Jim because Jim's got some, you know, fantastic points and philosophies <laughs> on like why Drupal for Penn State specifically. Yeah, so why 
Drupal, Drupal is accepted here um, by and large, not entirely, but a, as a standard. And there's a major commitment to open source more generally here. So meeting, meeting our workforce, our developers where they are, both in like skill and in spirit, was essential for this project. So what we're trying to do here is sort of reinvest our commitment to open source and uh, and uh, use. Drupal, in, in in our sense, sort of leverage it in the right spot, in the right in the right ecosystem and platform, to achieve like a more standardized vision of how to how to use Drupal. And it's not all Drupal, so there's other pieces now that we're sort of bolting on to give it structure, um, and attach it to more you know larger strategies and sort of DevOps and hosting uh, and uh, preview experiences as well. Right. So um, let's talk a minute here about Drupal as uh, a content authoring tool and dig into that point a little bit more. Um, some things that uh, Media Current, Penn State really value uh, through the process uh, using Drupal as a content authoring tool, which is very important, um, is that, uh, you know, you can make Drupal function in a way that works best for your organization. It's highly customizable. Um, again, that's through, you know, custom code, but also through all that contributed uh, open source source code uh, with Drupal's content authoring experience. It's cr is, is critical to success to have a good uh, authoring experience uh, for this project. Uh, and that's true for traditional websites, but it's also very important, as Tim mentioned, talking about that connection and mapping from Drupal to Gatsby on the front end. Um, it's important that decoupled site editors can also create and see what they expect uh, through their content layout and the previews of the content, which We'll say pixel perfect previews a number of times. Jim said it, I'll say it a few times because that was really important to this project. Um, from an API first architecture, I mean, I, I go back and I remember Dries talking about at a DrupalCon how his vision for Drupal years ago was to be that content hub. And it it's like, it's realized in this project. Uh, you know, this project actually, uh, the single Drupal uh, instance powers, uh, you know, many websites other than the new site uh, throughout the campuses. It can power digital signage, it can power alert systems, it can power native applications more in the future. And that's really exciting for a content editor. Uh, imagine entering content once and it goes out everywhere. That's really the bottom line of that dream. So, we talked why Drupal, let's talk why decoupled just briefly because that, that usually comes up in these projects uh, for decoupled or headless projects. Um, so both traditional Drupal builds and decoupled builds um, are legitimate directions for architecting complex websites. Um, at Media Current, we still build full, you know, full uh, front end, back end Drupal sites uh, without decoupled. There's reasons to do that. Uh, it really depends on the project requirements and the organizational goals. Uh, and, and Jim's already outlined a you know number of those goals that uh, you know laid into why decoupled Gatsby was the right move for this, um, but also um, you know having that content hub, um, Gatsby is just one of the many consumers of the data from the Penn State News site. That's really important. Um, and again, putting my security hat on just a bit, um, I love that security um, is a focus, and we have Garter, which is a Drupal security distribution. Uh, with a combination of uh, Drupal modules and configurations baked into this platform. Um, so that's on the Drupal side. And also uh, we're leveraging Penn State's authentication system uh, using SAML uh, to provide authentication for all of those content editors. Now this gives a lot of uh, power. Uh, as you might imagine, you've got 250 uh, approximate uh, content editors accessing a system and new people come in. Some people maybe aren't content editors any longer. It's great to be able to manage that through an existing Penn State system. Um, and and I'm, I don't have to manage it. Uh, Jim and others manage it, but I, I'm, I'm hearing from him that that helps. <laughs> and on the Gatsby front end side of things, um, from a security standpoint, you've got static. Um, you've got a static site. Uh, we don't have any type of authentication um, at this point on the front end. Um, that definitely helps. Uh, and also just the separation of development roles. So front-end developers have access to their systems to work on the front-end, back-end developers in Drupal have access to work and develop in their system. So, um, so yeah, security is something that's a big part um, of, of this decision. So jumping into Gatsby, 
um, you know, Gatsby's framework, which is what developers experience on the command line and when they're building Gatsby sites, um, it's a React based framework. And that means that working with Gatsby is readily accessible to a world of JavaScript developers. Um, my experience personally with Gatsby is it makes things easy for me as a developer versus coding those common needs from scratch. I'm um, using Gatsby plugins and themes and things like that to help. And, and I'll just say this briefly, from years of being a Drupal developer and coming from that experience, um, Gatsby felt very comfortable for me because the plugin uh, system and the theme system, like there's a lot of parallels, um, uh, you know, that I can see from how Drupal looks at modules and themes. So while it's different in a lot of ways, uh, I found that the parallels uh, helped me a lot. Um, you know, if I need to install an SEO module, there's similar plugins in Gatsby as there are in Drupal. Um, and um, speaking of developer experience, I think it's key to maintain and improve websites and applications efficiently. I think we all agree on that. Gatsby standardizes how all content's pulled into the front end and displayed. It's using GraphQL to do that. This improves the speed of maintenance and new feature work uh, for the front end code base, um, which is just really beneficial. And um, we'll talk more about Gatsby Cloud uh, in this talk today, but it really is fast and reliable and it helps us get those published sites and preview sites working. We've spent a lot of time building and improving the speed with Gatsby as a partner. Um, but, but really Gatsby cloud builds, um, uh, they're deployed to a, a best in class edge network, which, uh, helps a lot, uh, when it comes to making the site accessible to users who want to access the content. And I love that, um, it's always improving as a service. Um, that's great to see. Fantastic. All right. So let's dive into this uh, sort of storytelling system that, that you built with all these components. We've got, we got tons of questions and I want to make sure we have time for those. So let's, let's get into some of these details and, and, and run on through. Sounds good, Tim. Um, so really a key to telling stories uh, for um, Penn State um, and, and allowing Penn State designers to be able to efficiently translate their, their designs into component-based uh, systems is the living style guide. It's a great way to test design work uh, in a web context and find issues ahead of actual front end development. While front end designs uh, work is happening, Drupal developers are able to work uh, on adding in content authoring needs to support new designs. And it's great to have teams working in parallel while they're communicating and collaborating. So I mentioned living style guide and I'm really excited about this part. Um, Throughout the build, um, we were able to leverage and continue to uh, a living style guide to help designers and developers understand how applications would look and feel. And when it comes to accessibility support, that is also tied back to the living style guide. So that guide, which gives us those component level pieces and lets us see everything like in the smallest uh, atomic point before it's all put together and uh, made into a page. Uh, it gives us the ability to test uh, accessibility at the component level. It lets us find those problems with accessibility before they even make it to a page. Uh, and it's really critical for Penn State to get the news out to anyone who needs it or wants to consume it. So I'm going to talk just briefly here about Gatsby Preview. But this is important, you know, we've mentioned that uh, pixel perfect uh, previews and uh, content editors, they just need to be able to preview content. It's very important. So Gatsby Cloud and the Gatsby Drupal module, which is open source, allow viewing of full pixel perfect previews in Drupal. It's in an iframe and uh, you can see an animation there that shows uh, how you can view that. There's, um, and these can be, uh, these views can actually be unpublished. These previews can be unpublished revisions of Drupal um, or published. Uh, but the team also uh, worked here to add an instant preview, which has made it into the Gatsby module, I believe. And uh, that um, that is neat because it actually shows us quickly uh, exactly what Drupal has stored as far as data. And you can contrast that as a content editor against the pixel perfect preview. All right, so content moderation is just an important aspect of storytelling here for this project. So content authoring at scale uh, requires a robust system to handle those 250 plus content contributors uh, with different access levels. And, uh, and we have to have this editorial process that uh, is 
secure and structured. Well, Drupal comes out of the box to handle users, permissions, and roles, and that's a piece of content moderation that's important in the planning. So we spent a great deal of time really managing and planning that. But it also has, uh, Drupal has content moderation built in. Um, used to be add-on modules and things, and that made it into core Drupal eventually. But that allows us to actually have things in draft and go through a process to schedule content to go out and then to publish it. But all of these groups and roles uh, can and systems overall uh, have been and can be enhanced with custom code to match any of the requirements. All right, so we are going to jump into um, a part that a lot of us look forward to, and that's digging into the tech a little bit. This is a diagram of the tech stack involved with this project. Um, so I'm going to hit some highlights um, briefly here. So Drupal being the content hub, um, it's driving all those API endpoints, and it drives them right now um, overall for the Penn State campus sites that are consuming news content. It's, drive, it's providing API support for Gatsby Cloud to build uh, the publish and preview sites. It's also pushing out to Firebase to handle the campus alert system, uh, which appears at the top of the pages uh, on the campus news site. Uh, we do leverage AWS S3. Um, uh, Penn State already had AWS, which is great, and was already a partner with them. So we were able to use that to uh, drive uh, image styles and save those when they're first accessed. Uh, and then they're available to subsequent users. Uh, the headlines email system is also exciting and driven all from Drupal. Um, those are plain text and uh, HTML emails that are sent by the millions per year uh, that Jim mentioned earlier. And uh, that, that Drupal handles building those plain text and HTML rich emails. It sends it to a listserv and that listserv disseminates it to the list. Um, and um, yeah, so, you know, I noted earlier uh, about the separate Git repos. You can see those for the Drupal and Gatsby instances there. Uh, and just one last note on the APIs that Drupal provides campus systems. There's there's already requests coming in, apparently, uh, uh, you know, to, ha to add more capabilities for this, and the, uh, more access, really, to this new system, which is great. So I think that's exciting. Of all the things that I'm excited about, well, there's about 30 things I'm really excited about, but I wanted to call out the Firebase integration to support real-time alerting is super powerful for us in that we can decouple the site yet still have real-time listening uh, to, to, to Drupal on a, on, a static, on a static component. It gives us the opportunity to think about federated sort of nav bars and alerting across the university. And we're piloting that right now on PSU.edu and news, but it's a, it's a, that's a, that's a big idea for us. That's awesome, Jim. I, I agree completely. Um, so we'll jump here into content authoring experience. Um, we've talked a bit about that and um, uh, you can see an animation here showing all the many taxonomies. That was a big part of this. So Drupal has so many baked in features that we use to make this platform successful, user roles, permissions, content moderation, which we've talked about, but taxonomy was really huge in this project. Um, and um, that's a part of, you know, all the things you get with Drupal core, but there's also a lot of contributed modules that supported this project along the way, as you might imagine, in the Drupal community, and also some custom code. And, and those factored into our scheduled publishing system, uh, things like field character limits and character counts in the UI. Uh, we were able to focus on really clear uh, field labels and descriptions to make it easy for content editors to know what a field does. It's amazing how important that is. It may not be the most exciting thing for a developer, but it is really important for an editor to have that. Um, and then those Drupal paragraphs based layouts. Um, I have to say Penn State, um, having already a partnership with Acquia and that continuing, that's been able to ensure Drupal runs well for all of these editors and those API endpoints. And that's, that's really been fantastic along the way to have that support. Um, and again, Gatsby preview for those pixel perfect previews is, is just critical for these um, content authors. All right. So when it comes to um, Gatsby and, and what's made that really successful for this project, um, I have to just say Gatsby Cloud and the Gatsby framework um, 
and the related open source components that just allows Gatsby to integrate uh, well with Drupal. And during this project, a great deal of time was spent um, by all parties involved um, on the development side, improving performance uh, throughout the platform, uh, really end to end, and making sure that builds were speedy and that they exceed stakeholder expectations. And uh, just really excited to continue that uh, along the way. Um, an advantage was realized with Gatsby Cloud uh, along here on this project that um, Penn State's platform benefits from those continuous improvements in Gatsby Cloud. Uh, and, and Gatsby, I think owning that process end to end in Gatsby Cloud from uh, the builds through deployment is, is a benefit. Uh, so it's, it's uh, you know, we really have that partnership with Gatsby and that partnership with Acquia to really make those things work well. And, um, and I just love that Gatsby is rapidly improving and building new features into the framework that developers use and those cloud services. Uh, and I see Penn State benefiting uh, on that from years to come. So today is we kind of wrap up and we get ready to move into some q and I, I couldn't it really all the three of us here, Tim and Jim and I, we, we, we wanted to end on a, just a, the great story of Penn State uh, news and the open source story aspect here, because open source is really what many of us are excited about. Um, it's important for the business. And, um, you know, as, as we talked earlier a bit, Penn State University just has a history of heavy involvement in open source communities, not just Drupal, but Drupal being one of those. Uh, the new Penn State news platform uh, benefits from open source with Drupal and Gatsby. The Drupal community provided the core Drupal code and many contributed modules. Um, and some other ways that it's Drupal's open source uh, community has helped is uh, really just the community support um, along the way and the issue queues and the patches that are provided to help this platform launch. Yes, we have patches from Drupal that's in the open source community in the project, as many other Drupal sites do. Um, that's great. The Gatsby community um, was also heavily involved in improving the Gatsby source plugin uh, for Drupal uh, and providing necessary plugins to ensure that front end is fast, accessible, and has good SEO results. Well, it makes good business sense to utilize open source, as it can be seen in all these examples we've talked about. Penn State, Media Current, and Gatsby have also been committed to contributing back to open source via the Gatsby plugin and Drupal module patches and improvements. And one example of this that I'm really excited about is that Media Current and Gatsby uh, partnered um, to dedicate resources and to pull in improvements from this project and contribute that back to the open source community. And again, that carries through what, you know, Jim talked about the importance that Penn State had puts on open source and that new 2.0.0 release is in beta. I think it's beta one right now. Um, and it's listed as the Gatsby integration module, but check that out. That should be coming to a stable release near you very soon. Um, and to me, this is really open source working. I mean, this is what, you know, not, not every project works this way. We're using open source and we give back. But this is amazing how this is what I think of uh, open source working through and through. Um, and, I, and I just couldn't leave without saying, <laughs> um, as a community member, if you'd like to help and get involved with uh, the uh, Drupal integration module, uh, please reach out to some of the maintainers of the project in Drupal Slack's Gatsby channel. Uh, you can also get involved directly in the Gatsby integration modules issue queue. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Jim, for the conversation today and for sharing this case study. We're going to go into Q&A now. Um, there's tons of questions and tons of engagement in chat, which is really fantastic. I love Great. to see it. Um, I'm going to take them largely in the order they came in. I may group a couple of these things together. Um, just really quickly to cover some of the ones answered by text. Um, won't go into super detailed. Um, we were asked sort of what search function is kind of used or recommended. Um, Jim mentions using uh, you know, the larger uh, PSU edu system using Google search, uh, but using Apache Solar for the PSU news local search um, and indexable searchable uh, by site users. Um, Aaron asked if graduate schools were part of the project or was just PSU.edu. Jim, I think this is worth actually dwelling on a little bit yourself to talk about how this is a beginning, a sort of a start for um, addressing that, that original problem we talked about, about all the different brands being balkanized, right? So... Yeah, I mean, in short, so this project right now, this phase of our roadmap is about, it, it was around building building out this flagship platform, right? Penn State 
news. Certainly the graduate schools are consumers, they're marketing community, community communicator team, they contribute to the system and they extract their, you know, segments of content back out. But phase one, they were, they, they were not part of our pilot for actually adopting the entire standard, but stay tuned. Awesome. Very cool. Um, we have another quick question here, which is, um, there was mention, I think, along the way of integrating with a sort of an academic tenure management tool. Someone's cu yeah. just curious what that tool is, if you're able to share it. Yeah, sure. I mean, and we're no longer integrating. It was the old system. It was digital measures, and there is still there are there is still some Drupal integrations with digital measures happening at Penn State. If that's if that's of interest, you can contact me offline. But this platform, we jettisoned that. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, another question here for you, Jim, was um, you know we've talked about we talked about requirements and the choice of Drupal, but but stepping back a little bit. Had you looked at other headless specific CMS options, whether open source or proprietary, like content as a service providers, like Content Stack, Netlify, Contentful, and what made you decide that staying with Drupal was the right track? So that's a pretty good question. Um, I don't have any sort of prepared notes. I'm going to shoot off the hip, hook, hip a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Um, like I've talked about, Penn State's already leveraged in Drupal, so we we didn't go to this. We didn't go to market with an RFP that said do it in Drupal. But we describe we we very much tried to write our RFP not prescriptively, right? Just describe the need and the needs only. We were open to hearing a a recommendation for something other than Drupal, but ultimately we were convinced that especially with our migration needs. That Drupal was, in fact, in fact, the right tool at the CMS level. Uh, but you know, we're using Drupal just for content management API and, and, and workflow security, et cetera, et cetera. So it sort of led to this the architecture that you've seen. You know, you saw our you saw our our our, our map. It's it's a it's a pretty broad architecture. So we looked. So content fill, we kind of ruled that out. We looked at other hosting providers. Ultimately landed on, what well, I shouldn't say we landed on Gatsby for a certain reason. What we were looking for was integrated, integrated DevOps hosting, hosting at predictable cost and, uh, and it, it sort of, and like a, and, and the pixel perfect decoupled preview option. There's very few, maybe no other alternatives in the market that do that right now. So it, it ultimately became just the most cost-effective solution to go with that. But we're always open to to more, you know, yeah. something new and different. And I think you know, um, the capabilities just match so much the needs of your use case, and especially that architecture of making it the sort of the center of the content hub with multiple sort of levels of integration points. I think. Um, yes, some of those other headless options have some of those capabilities, but I think the breadth of the different integrations, whether it's, you know, the Firebrace alerts continues to be like magic, right? Continues to be like uh, um, real-time alerting together with sort of this uh, decoupled front-end publishing together with all these other components you're integrating with, other campus sites consuming the APIs from different platforms. Um, yeah, I think it's a cool, a cool choice. Um, this might be a question for you, Mark. Uh, any reason you, that you used uh, paragraphs over Layout Builder? And I'm not sure if that's exactly the right way to understand the question, but. Oh, no, I, 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 I get the spirit of that. Um, yeah, I, you know, um, I, I think from a, con, from a situation uh, where you have news stories and um, the way articles are structured, paragraphs and the way you can order those uh, components in order kind of laid out really well in that story model uh, where I think um, we didn't really need, need to use layout builder for that um, uh, but I think you know it's one of those things where as layout builder continues to to improve as paragraphs continue to improve I mean it's it's kind of that whole uh, story like Jim was just talking like you're always evaluating new things um, uh, but I think there's also uh, there needs to be uh, a bit more work and there's work in the community going on for layout builder and decoupled integration um, that kind of needs to be continued to work on and improve to get there. Cool. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we got several questions from, from Jason here that are all in a related area and it has to do with a sort of living style guide and pattern library architecture, maybe getting into the details a little bit more. Um, first of all, let me step back for a second. Can you elaborate on your definition of what a living style guide means? 
Yeah. Um, so when it comes to a, a living style guide, I mean, uh, to me, that's a style guide where, uh, well, I'll contrast it to a print style guide where it's in a book, um, old school style. Um, and they're still out there where you can see like print versions of components or, you know, typography and colors and all that. Living style guide is actually, um, you know, web-based. So you get to actually uh, test the accessibility of components. You actually have working components that are running JavaScript and things like that and processing the CSS as it would on the site. Um, and that allows uh, stakeholders, it allows QA to actually experience all those components as they are and evaluate them before they the work's done to integrate them into a front end website um, and allow you to kind of like go back and make changes and edits there. Um, and, I, and hopefully it speeds things up along the way. Awesome. And so when you talk about sort of the software stack involved, you mentioned Storybook, of course, as being a kind of a part of this. Can you can you maybe walk through the architecture of like how something even post deployment, how how some new element or adjustment to a component would go, you know, to design to Storybook and the 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 like living uh, style guide and then to deployment? Like, does it does it run through a, a, a sort of chain uh, like that? Yeah, that's that's pretty close, uh, Tim, to, to what happens. And um, so, uh, you know, we want to start with design and actually looking at the actual need and like what the change is about. And uh, um, and design will relay that to um, uh, usually a front end developer that will then uh, integrate that into Storybook. Um, and one thing that I really like about that, that point is when that is integrated in Storybook, we'll actually run it through a QA and UAT process so that everybody signs off and says, yes, what is in the living style guide in storybook is exactly what we expect to be on the site. Um, and from there, um, once that passes those levels, we can go ahead and start to integrate and in, right into uh, uh, the needs that need to happen in Drupal because there may be, need to be new fields added, there may be new structure or module changes in Drupal. And then of course, on the front end, uh, those components need to be updated on the front end and we'll, we'll cycle through then uh, that full end-to-end -end suite through QA and UAT before it's deployed. And um, I want to make sure I have room for the additional questions here, but I think this was just a great set of questions from Jason. So still related to great. that style guide and publishing process, um, is the, are the sort of real style components, um, do they get, you know, obviously you're using a decoupled front end, right? So you're not necessarily using Twig templating engine, but could they right. publish directly your Twig templates or in this case, whatever your sort of Gatsby visual components are, or is that sort of a separate step that's slightly different in terms of the, the backend rendering of those components? Yeah, I, you know, we've really, on this on this uh, platform, it, it's highly, um, it's highly separate, separated, you know, between Drupal um, and there's not any twig involved in the storybook and that front end. Um, however, along the way, there were some evaluation and, and at media current, we've, we've still looked at the possibilities when it's needed um, to actually take twig um, and actually have that drive storybook or some other living style guide. I think there's some ways to do that now. Um, I've been hearing from some of our front end team. And um, so that is of interest. I, I, don't think it would fit on this platform right now, uh, the way I see Less it, but, for this particular but, but yeah, I can see why it's something that Jason would ask. Cause it definitely is a need that uh, we've seen on some other projects. And yeah, and certainly, you know, even in this case, Jason, as you can see, it, it can be used in both Drupal and non-Drupal environments, both just the concept of a living storybook, excuse me, of a living style guide and the storybook tool specifically. Um, Next question here is from Al. Gosh, we had so many questions. I want to. I hope we can get through them all. Uh, we'll go quickly on this one. Uh, it's for you, Jim. Um, hosting options. What did you consider before you settled on what you talked about, which was using a partner, a managed services partner like Acquia? And what kind of were the main challenges or, or the main reason to make a particular decision for you? So I don't think this is strictly a question for me to answer. We. we... And I, I'm, I'm hesitant. I'm actually a little bit hesitant to sort of talk about other about other services and our reasons for going with it. I think that cost predictability was really important to us being able to plan year over sure. year with flat fees for, like I say, a whole bundle, a whole bundle of services we did. We are using AWS for a piece of this architecture. It is 
what's underneath psu.edu were highly invested in AWS, it wasn't the right choice for this project. We looked at Netlify, we and we landed ultimately Gatsby Cloud is partners with Fastly. So this the CDN is Fastly at the at the at the root of this. That's the right decision for this project. And I, I'd be more comfortable answering more details sort of off offline if the user would like to contact me. Sure, of course. Yeah. But I think that I think that gives uh, a, a good picture into sort of just your governing decision tree, and in particular, the importance of that cost predictability component, yeah. which I think many people will will resonate. Um, there was a series of questions in chat um, uh, that folks were going back and forth on for a little while. Um, and I think, Mark, you can address this a little bit. Uh, Mehdi asked, um, I previously used Drupal and Gatsby, but had issues with having basically to rebuild the entire content, do the whole build. Um, and that made it slow and kind of put a delay. You talked about working with the Gatsby folks on improvements, on the incremental build options in Gatsby Cloud. I mean, is that more or less how you solve that sort of issue? Something people should revisit? There, there is so much to unpack with that. And, uh, and, and Jim and I hope to dig into more of that at DrupalCon during our talk um, sure. <laughs> where we dig in. But I will say, and Jim, I want you to feel free to, of course, comment where you want to add to if I miss something, but at a high level, Yes, we are highly familiar with having to rebuild all the content and 65,000 plus stories to rebuild takes some time. And uh, with the help of uh, Gatsby and other folk team members at Media Current, we were able to reduce the time to do full, full builds like in, in hours to a point now where uh, full builds are only needed when we Jim and I really wanted them to be needed. And that's more like during code deploys where you have to, um, or, you know, certain changes like that. And, and so we've moved. So anybody familiar with Gatsby, I'll just mention this. We we're moving more with the new Gatsby module improvements. That's the community has been working on. Uh, we're using, um, fast builds, uh, versus the, um, the more traditional Gatsby incremental builds that folks may be familiar with. So they perform incremental builds, uh, but Drupal provides like, this is the only things that have changed back to Gatsby. And then that's what they run with. Right. Okay. So yeah. So the, the, the part of the sort of publishing payload that goes to Gatsby tells it what changed and what didn't and what they need yeah. to worry about. Yeah. And that, that was huge. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. It's a big topic. <laughs> so we got less than 10 minutes and still at least yeah. 12 questions. So it's going to be lightning round. We'll try and go quick here. Awesome. Um, so Mustafa asks, any idea about paragraph module without using sort of traditional WYSIWYG or CK editor? I guess this is a question about, did you look at alternatives for the actual like um, interface you're using together with paragraphs? I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, well, what I'm hearing from that is, uh, is really, you know, because you have so many options with paragraphs, how to build, and even with layout builder, because that was brought up earlier, um, you have so many options of what goes into those, the paragraph or the the block and layout builder. And, and yeah, I, I think we tried to stay focused on that content authoring experience and like, were the fields, were the things we were adding into the paragraph, was that the right thing for the user uh, that's editing the content and not, not just so that they were happy and satisfied with it, but also for the governance of the system itself, like that whole content architecture piece. It, sure. You know, we want to stay away from just having like, we do have WYSIWYGs in some places, but we want we don't want to just WYSIWYG everything. We want to make sure, sure that there's sure. content architecture and you feel the things that need to be fielded. Um, and that does impact things like Gatsby and APIs that need to consume the content. Okay, cool. Um, this is with respect to what you described in terms of the image publishing going pushing up to uh, S3 on AWS. Is that sort of comprise your digital asset management tool, or is there an, are there any other components to how you do digital asset management? So I'll answer the question. We went to market in the RFP saying thinking that we needed a dam, and we asked for one, and we ended up not needing a dam. And so I'll leave it to Shrop to describe like how how uh, how S3 is involved in this, and sort of what does it, it's the surrogate for. Yeah. So, um, so it's, it's pretty simple. Um, when you, when you upload it, if the content editor uploads a new image, let's say to a piece of content, uh, that image, um, is uploaded, uh, through Drupal. Uh, 
And when uh, builds happen in Gatsby, let's say an end user hits that story for the first time it's published. Um, and the first time they access that image, um, those, those images are then, uh, the image styles are then generated and pushed out uh, to S3. So if it doesn't already exist, exist in S3, then Drupal handles pushing all those styles out to S3. And that's that subsequent uh, part. So any future users then already have, you know, Drupal's aware that those images exist and it's checking for those and it doesn't have to, you know, try to rebuild those every time. So uh, we're still letting Drupal manage uh, image styles if that helps for Drupal, yeah. <laughs> Drupal folks. Awesome. Um, the questions keep coming in. So I'm afraid everyone, I'm just gonna have to ask <laughs> one or two more and then wrap us up here. Um, if you wanna grab your questions um, in the chat, um, uh, Dave Terry of Media Current has put his email address where you could reach out with some additional questions there. Um, you can certainly also reach out to us at the Drupal Association. We'll pass things on as well. Um, I think this question is a good one. It might wind up being the last one we can answer, which is just you've, you've talked about working collaboratively with two major open source projects, both Gatsby and Drupal. Um, that's a lot of contributors to work with and, and working in an environment that's uh, that has a lot of volunteer driven work and things like that. So how do you how did you manage staff working together with sort of open source contributors to get what you needed out of these tools? So I Jim, you want me to I, I can say from, start, yeah. Um, it's a sharp question. I can just say sharp you is, you kick us off, brother. Yeah, I'll just say from a from a media current standpoint point and this is something that um i've seen over the years damian mckenna um who is, is a, a prolific <laughs> contributor to drupal um I, and, and he's a mentor of uh he, he he's definitely mentored me in this um at media current we value trying to work in the open source community in the project itself like like the work and when you have partners like penn state that value open source it becomes easy we don't try to like nights and weekends do open source work i mean we may but we like to actually work and when we need, have a need, like it's part of the project work. So if I have a ticket internal at Media Current and it has open source needs and someone works on it, like that work happens right inside in the community from there. And um, we're, we just follow, you know, Drupal.org protocols. If, if I don't know or a developer has questions, we'll ask Damien or someone in our internal contrib channel. Um, but I will say, to the question in general, yeah, it is it is challenging, but we think the reward is uh, is greater, um, you know, than the effort put in. Uh, but it is it is an effort. It is a different way of working than proprietary software, without a doubt. Yeah, and uh, as Dave points out in the chat, there's also if you look back in the association YouTube channel at past DrupalCons, you'll be able to probably find some how to create a contribution culture uh, sessions that have some really good tips along this front as well. Um, I think we need to make sure we have enough time to sort of uh, wrap up and conclude here. So I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to not take any further questions at this time. Please do grab your questions if you want to send them on to other folks. Jim, let me hand it over to you so that you can uh, uh, wrap up your portion, then you, Mark, and then I'll close us out. I, I have no great words of wisdom here. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. And I'm, I encourage you to reach out to me if you have uh, individual questions offline, LinkedIn or my or Jay Norris at Penn State. Edu. Thank you. Awesome. Fantastic. Mark, how about you? Any last words? Yeah. yeah uh, just really enjoyed uh, um, presenting here today, and and it's just exciting to see um, so many questions, and 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 that there's so many other technical ways to solve these same challenges. And as we continue to um, grow those areas, it'll continue to improve. You know, the story's not over. When you launch, you still have. Uh, years of maintenance and exciting feature improvements to go from there. So we're excited to do that. And uh, again, just like Jim, just uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, if you have uh, questions and we can, we'd love to carry the discussions forward. Awesome. Again, I want to thank everybody for attending today. There is going to be, uh, uh, there's an accepted session uh, also on this subject and on this project for DrupalCon in Portland at the end of April. You can find more information at events.drupal.org slash Portland 2022. Um, so that might be a good place for an even further technical deep dive. Um, uh, we encourage you to join us there. We encourage you to support the Drupal Association. If you go to drupal.org slash association, you can find ways to support us as a nonprofit organization, both as individuals or as organizations and keep the Drupal ecosystem and the Drupal community strong. Um, I wanna thank Jim for joining us and telling an amazing story about Penn State. 
I want to thank Mark for joining us and talking about how Media Current helped realize the vision of these requirements and sort of advance the concept of Drupal as the center of a content hub. And again, I want to thank all of you in our audience for your attendance today, um, uh, for your fantastic questions and engagement. And we look forward to talking to you again in another upcoming webinar. Yeah, Thanks there's a lot of great questions. Bye. <laughs> Thank all you, right. everybody. Bye-bye for now.